Hi, and welcome to the last part of Chapter 8. Uh, this part uh, exclusively deals with Tudor and Elizabethan England. And the reason they are separate is that Tudor England had identical clothes to the Renaissance, but after they're split from the Catholic Church and there rises a superpower, they begin adapting current fashions to their own taste. Uh, they're an island, so they are a little bit separated from mainland Europe, but they also look to themselves. They have a little bit of a chip on their shoulders after defeating the Spanish Armada. So they've taken these medieval clothes and kind of grafted the Renaissance onto them, which made for a very distinctive look. The last full expression of, of um, what you might call the Euro European Renaissance fashion, which is just pure European, where they just copy them, um, is the period of Henry VIII. You can see in regalia that uh, trunk hose, um, that ridiculous kind of over-decorated cog piece, those big old sleeves and those little hose there, making for that, that bulky silhouette. That was pretty much expressed finally in the time of Henry VIII. This is an English jacket he's wearing. It's called a jerkin there. And you can see that the jerkin is this whole thing right here. Whoops, not that. <laughs> those are canyons or barrel breeches, which are like trunk hose except they're a little not as padded there as you can see um <clears throat> we have long coats with padded shoulders you're going to see this more and more often they're turned back you can see here this is just a, this is called dog line sleeves so it shows the lining you want to show not only have a nice coat but your coat is so badass it has a beautiful lining it makes a very blocky strong masculine silhouette that henry the eighth liked this is something to see more often uh, these days. You'll see gaiters, leather covers for his hose and his shoes. So when he's riding or he's even walking through the muddy streets of London, his hose will not get messed up or his shoes. Here we see Mary, Queen of Scots, in a Spanish gown. This is black and white, but imagine that that overskirt, underskirt is black and the trim is gold. She has a pomander and a coif edged with pearls and a brocaded partlet padded sleeves. Full skirts there. Um, we have um, a farthingale option called the drum or wheel farthingale. They're hoops, but instead of gaining in size like the Spanish, they are all of one size. So it's kind of like a drum. Um, you can see she's got the elongated bodice, this woman on top here, thanks to the corset now. And then uh, she's got this ruff, which is supported by this wireframe called the supportas. You see down here, so. Uh, oh, here's a picture of a, a wheel farthingale. This is more like uh, what's known as a, I think you'll see in a second, as a bum roll. Um, <clears throat> you have this, this disc that can be pushed down by the corset right here, and it pops up in the back, so you get kind of a weird bustle. There. <clears throat> we'll see more of that later on. Uh, here we see, uh, gentlemen, the, the cod piece is gone. Yay! But we have this really interesting kind of jerkin. If you see, watch a movie uh, set in the Elizabethan period, look for this. This is the peas cod belly. It's this little, I'm not sure where it came from, to be honest. It's a little padded waist thing that makes a little pot belly. And there we see a huge multi-layered starch collar. And then big puff sleeves. This is his jerkin right here. And then his uh, camisilla underneath, really, uh, that is also padded. <laughs> now here we see this is by the time of Elizabeth I I think this is one of her courtiers uh, it may be Sir Walter Raleigh uh, he has shoulder wings he has these epaulets here and a doublet because it's not white so sort of jerkin doublet shirt and then underneath you can see that may be the edge of the camisilla he has trunk hose that are slashed maybe pained and like I said we're starting to realize by the time we get to Elizabeth um, she, she's not going to care about this stupid cod piece. They're gone. Here you see a woman wearing uh, shoulder wings as well, open hanging sleeves. We start to see this is something more too, this elongated front. So we have the corset underneath and this is the bodice. And then on top of the bodice uh, is this stiffy piece of fabric. So this is, this is different. This is a stomacher. It's like the plaster, if you remember from the Middle Ages, the plastron front. It's more of a shaped 
stomacher. Now, if you remember, in your, you know, if we make a pattern, you can see it's going to have a gentle S curve right here to take into account the bus line on the pattern, but it's, it's a separate piece that can be tied or stitched onto the bodice. Also, we start to see more of these little hanging tabs, hanging tabs called picadills that uh, come off the doublet or the jerkin or the bodice. QE1 here shown wearing a bodice with a stomacher, large picadills, and then these sleeves are leg of mutton sleeves. And then she's got a large drum farthingale that's allowed to hang down with uh, a pometer with a globe of the world because she's queen of the world. And then this uh, supportas um, uh, collar. The rainbow portrait, we see her wearing a conch, a sheer pearl edge cape at the back of wire support. So it makes this sort of wing like fairy structure. And then the modified two horned hen and headdress, a leftover from the Middle Ages, the old days this is more uh this is the bum roll which is like the wheel farthingale but but it's not got hoops of metal or bone it's a round roll of padded fabric that ties to the waist over the petticoat so it's not as severe this will become very popular and common and i want to say it keeps going for up to the 18th century so i will say it Here's a working class man in the street. You can see he's got, uh, I think he's a, a seaman, a sailor. Uh, he's got his breeches and trunk hose. Um, so we start to see his trunk hose is pulled down. His breeches become kind of socks and then his trunk hose become kind of trousers. So we're starting to see pants or trousers in the era. The first real pair of trousers actually. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the cosmetics of Queen Elizabeth. Um, if you're pale, that means you don't work in the sun. So that means you are wealthy, or you are nobility, or you are both. So pale skin is a must-have. <clears throat> and smooth skin shows that you've not been ravaged by disease. Uh, poxes, smallpox, chickenpox, a very common ailment and would leave disfig disfiguring scars. So what are you going to do? Uh, ceruse, a mixture of white lead and vinegar applied liberally. Face spackle. Then you take some egg glaze to set the mask and to hide the wrinkles. And there you have it. You have smoothed out that complexion with a thick layer of makeup of lead, vinegar, and egg glaze. Now the trouble is, it's what's called terrible acne. So you really couldn't do it overnight. You'd, and you'd have to clean your face you know, every night at least, um, it would be a mixture of rose water and lemon juice. So you would do that, but the next morning you get up and you would ceruse it on again, and then a red face paint known as fucus, which uh, mostly the, the, the cochineal carmen is part of that. Also applied on the cheeks and on the mouths for small rosy lips. You wouldn't necessarily find um, follow the outline of your lips, but you would shape them with the with the lipstick with the fucus. Here's some other things you might want to know if you're Elizabethan beauty. If you wash your face in mercury, uh, it's an Elizabethan version of a face peel or chemical peel. Drops of belladonna in the eye give a youthful sparkle, then outline with coal. Pluck eyebrows, pluck hairlines, push back an inch or more to achieve the desired effect of a high, smooth forehead. That means you were smart. Because Queen Elizabeth's hair was red, desired hair color was red or reddish blonde. <clears throat> what you would do is you would take henna from the east, you'd mix it in with some uh, animal paste and urine, yes, urine again, uh, and then apply it to your hair and you would get the desired color. Okay, that's it. Just some quick examples. Uh, there's so many movies set in the Renaissance and the Elizabethan period that the research is um, is overwhelming, I guess you could say. There's, there's plenty of it, quite plentiful. Uh, Elizabeth I with Kate Blanchett. You can see won an Oscar for costuming. You can see good examples here in early version here in her Spanish farthingale. Uh, her, one of those dukes, I don't remember, who was her lover in his doublet. There you can see here the supportas, the stomacher. The Tudors was a bit fanciful. Uh, it was a show with um, that guy, I can't remember his name. Um, it was okay. Um, it was a little, they took a little bit of liberty, but they did have some nice clothing. You can see in the bottom right, the slashed sleeve there of his doublet. 
his first wife, Catherine, Catherine of Aragon, Aragorn, <laughs> um, wearing a garter or a roba. You can see almost a little bit of a high sleeve. So it's been definitely um, uh, anglicized, but still pretty nice. Down at the bottom, you can see um, uh, Henry's sister. This is this is a show about Henry VIII, young Henry VIII, by the way. Um, Catherine looks a little bit older than Henry. I don't think that age difference was that big. Anyway, you can see here uh, Henry dancing with his sister. She's got a bum roll on. And I put this, it's not to be salacious. This is Anne Bullen. But to show kind of the structure of a corset, you can see there. Uh, it's a sheer linen one there, and I think it's supposed to be. So she seduces him. But, um, but you can see the busking, which is kind of interesting. And the stomacher pattern. Shakespeare in Love, excellent costumes. I think they won as well. You can see here these um, shoulder wings. Shoulder wings, excuse me, on, on Jeffrey Rush. These are more Piccadills there. Good trunk hose on Jeffrey Rush right there. Uh, <clears throat> again, some good pictures. Queen Elizabeth in her prime. More doublets, so forth. Knights Ruffs. The Merchant of Venice, several different types of... Um, of, of variations or productions of that it is considered costuming wise to um, be a, a play of high renaissance so you see the doublets with the uh, slashed sleeves there the high collars mostly it's, it's italian so it's going to lean more towards italian than tudor there this is an interesting one this is a, a movie i think is about 20 years old, 20 years old called dangerous beauty it's um, a movie about a venetian courtesan and the world she inhabits. So you can see down here in the gondola, she's got the pretty, uh, pretty much the standard Venetian courtesan. You can see there Rufus Sewell, a very nice slashed and girded uh, sleeve on his doublet there. Some more. Oliver Platt, proud of his codpiece. Overskirt, underskirt here. Pretty good, pretty good. And that's it. We've gone through the Renaissance. We are now Renaissance scholars. So thank you for listening.